You know, if, if Mary could magnify the Lord before that babe was born, how much more can we, knowing what he accomplished? So let's pray. Lord, our souls do magnify you because of what you have accomplished for us in the gospel of your son. Thank you so much for him. Thank you for his great work at the cross. He who is mighty has done a great thing on our behalf, something we who are weak and frail could never do, and we marvel at the gospel of your son. Thank you for the book of Acts. Thank you for this series that we've been in where we've been able to just focus in on one book at a time. What a great revelation you have given to us, and it reveals you, it reveals your son, it reveals us, it reveals the hope that we have if we would only turn to your son. We pray that that would be accomplished even tonight, and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. All right, I want you to turn to two different places at the same time to be ready again. So turn to Luke chapter 1, and then Acts chapter 1. We are continuing on in our study in the 66 books of the Bible, and tonight we're going to give an overview on the book of Acts. And I want to encourage you, if you were not here a couple of weeks ago, to listen to the message I did on Luke, that you'll need to probably go back and get that, because Luke and Acts go together. You can't introduce Acts without looking at Luke. And you can't introduce Luke without looking at Acts because they are companion volumes by the same author. So let's start and let's talk about the author. The author is Luke. Luke was Paul's traveling companion in the book of Acts. And he was most likely Paul's personal physician. Colossians 4.14 says Paul refers to him as the beloved physician. And Luke is writing these two volumes to one man, to his acquaintance, Theophilus, who is some kind of a Roman dignitary or a Roman official, a Roman nobleman, somebody of a position of authority. And here's what Luke says in Luke chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, Just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word handed them down to us, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in orderly sequence, most excellent Theophilus. There's the title of nobility or honor, a dignitary. He did this so that you may know the certainty about the things you have been taught. I believe Theophilus is a disciple, and that is part of the Great Commission fulfilling itself in Theophilus. He was taught. It wasn't that he just heard about Jesus, but he was taught. Turn over to Acts chapter 1. Luke continues. The first account, O Theophilus, I composed. About what? About all that Jesus began to do and teach. Until the day when he was taken up to heaven after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over 40 days and speaking about the things concerning the kingdom of God. So God wanted to supply, get this, a Roman official in the first century with a two-volume account of the life of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the ascension of Jesus, and he wanted another volume to help detail out the expansion of the gospel and the church across the Roman Empire. God wanted a Roman official to have what makes up 30% of our New Testament. And the burning question is why? And there's not a lot of clarity. But somehow, I think Theophilus was connected to Paul's trial in Rome, except for the fact that it would be, had been over by it now, by the time he gets these writings. And so, was there some need to try to help Roman governing officials, somebody who could be persuasive, understand there's nothing to be afraid of in regards to Christianity and the spread of the church? Christianity is separate from Judaism, we don't know. That's my theory. 
but the author is Luke. Luke most likely finished writing his two-volume account at the time that Paul was imprisoned in Rome at the end of Acts 28. That puts the date of writing about AD 60 or 61. One commentator says, Luke and Acts are not merely two independent writings from the same pen. And so in that sense, I think it might be a little disservice to Luke to separate it from Acts and put it in with the synoptics because Luke never intended them to be separate. And so if anything, Luke goes well with Acts. If anything, it's Acts part one, Acts part two, as we'll talk about here in just a moment. But they're not merely two independent writings from the same pen. They are a single continuous work. Acts is neither an appendix nor is it an afterthought to Luke. It is an integral part of Luke's original plan and purpose for writing. So that's the author, Luke, two volumes. The title of Acts is the Acts of the Apostles. And remember, the titles are not a part of the inspired text, but they were added much later. later. Uh, Maybe a better title can come right out of Luke's own words in chapter 1, verse 1 of Acts. The first account, O Theophilus, I composed... It was about all that Jesus began to do and to teach, and he is still doing, and he is still working. So perhaps maybe a better title might be the Acts of Jesus Christ. Acts is about Jesus Christ and his next great work after the cross, after the empty tomb, after his ascension. So that's the author, that's the title. What about the purpose of Acts? That gets right to the purpose. There are multiple layered purposes going on. You can listen to the introduction that I did to Luke a couple weeks ago. But the main one in Acts is this. It is to show how the gospel and the church expanded across the Roman Empire within just 30 short years after Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension. So then think about what we have in both accounts, Luke and Acts. We have a written account of really the first 60 years from when the word became flesh, Luke chapter 2, all the way to his great work at the cross, through the empty tomb, to the preaching of the gospel, to Paul in the capital city of the Gentile world in Rome, planting churches across the Mediterranean world. That is the purpose of Acts. It is to show how the gospel and the church expanded across the Roman Empire within just 30 short years after Jesus' death. Is there an outline to this book? Is it arranged in any particular fashion? There is an outline. You can see it in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Look at that with me. Very familiar verse. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. And here's how the book of Acts is arranged. Both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the end of the earth. So it starts in Jerusalem. Witnesses of the resurrected Christ preached the gospel and planted the church in Jerusalem. That's Acts chapter 1 through about chapter 8, verse 3. And then witnesses of the resurrected Christ were scattered because of persecution, and they scattered into Judea and Samaria, and they preached the gospel, and they planted churches there. That's Acts chapter 8, verse 4, all the way through chapter 12. And then finally, the primary witness to the resurrected Christ that's focused on in chapters 13 to the end, to chapter 28, is the Apostle Paul. He preached the gospel and he planted the church across the Roman Empire to the end of the earth, towards the end of the earth, Acts 13 to Acts 28. So there's your author, there's the title, the purpose, and the outline. Now let me give you five keys to the book of Acts. I'm going to give you five keys. I'll give them to you up front and show you how they all fit together. So it starts with the fact that there are key leaders in the book of Acts. There's key leaders. And those key leaders, secondly, supply the key message. And they supply that key message, thirdly, to the key servants, who then carry out the key activity in the book of Acts, which results in the key outcome or the key expression that you find all throughout the book of Acts. So let's start with the key leaders. Who are the key leaders? Um, Obviously, it is Jesus Christ. This is about, Luke is writing about all that Jesus began to do and teach, and he is continuing 
to cover what Jesus Christ did. God the Son is the focal point. In the Gospel of Luke, at least two times, Luke pointed to the coming vindication of Jesus, the authoritative position that Jesus would achieve at the right hand of the Father. Go back to Luke for just a moment, because I want you to see this. Luke chapter 9, verse 31. This is the Mount of Transfiguration. Luke chapter 9, verse 31. You remember, he goes up on the mountain with Peter, John, and James, and he starts to pray. And as he's praying, his appearance is changed. His face became different. His clothing became white and gleaming. And behold, two men were talking with him. They were Moses and Elijah. Remember, he has said, some of you will not taste death until you see the kingdom of God. So here is the kingdom of God touching down on this mount. Moses and Elijah are there. Verse 31, they were appearing in glory and they were talking to him about something, what? His departure, which he was about to fulfill at Jerusalem. That's not his departure from the tomb, that's his departure from earth, his exodus. Not out into the wilderness, but he is gonna go into heaven. Look at the same chapter, verse 51. It happened that when the days for Jesus to be taken up were soon to be filled, there is his ascension again. So Jesus knows the days are coming when I have to depart this earth and go to the right hand of the Father. What did he do? He set his face to go to Jerusalem. I must go there and I must accomplish everything that is set before me by my Father. So he knows that day is coming. Look at Luke chapter 24. There's overlap between Luke 24 and Acts chapter 1. Look at this, Luke 24, verse 50. And Jesus, after his resurrection, he led his disciples out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them, and here's his departure. It happened that while he was blessing them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. So the vindicated Messiah gained the ultimate position of advantage. He's at the right hand of God. Who can thwart anything he thinks or does or wills? Death could not hold him in the grave. He burst forth from the grave. Acts picks up with this very ascension. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse 9. Turn there. Acts 1, 9. After he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. As they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside him. They also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking around or looking toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven, he will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. From there in heaven at the right hand of the Father, Jesus acts, he works. He's the focal point of the book of Acts. He achieves the next stage of his great work that he is doing, which runs all the way up until his kingdom. There's another key leader in the book of Acts. It's God, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. He's he's mentioned approximately 57 times in 28 chapters. He is the one who was poured out on those who believed in Acts chapter two on the day of Pentecost. And obviously then the other leader is God the Father, the third key leader. Now I want you to see this triune transaction that's taking place. Go to Acts chapter two, verse 33. Watch how these key leaders are at work at the beginning of the book of Acts. You do not, by the way, have the book of Acts if this transaction between the triune Godhead did not occur. Acts 2.33, therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, Peter says about Jesus, and having received from the Father the promise of God the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, God the Son has poured out this, which you both see and hear. So God the Son is at the right hand of the Father. God the Father gives to God the Son, God the Spirit. God the Son takes the Spirit and pours the Spirit out on his witnesses, and the book of Acts begins. With that going on, with that kind of leadership, governing, starting, initiating, inaugurating this work, nothing's going to stop them. They are expressing themselves as a triune Godhead in a united fashion uniquely. 
all for the proclamation of the gospel, for the making of disciples, for the planting of churches to the end of the earth. Those are the key leaders. And the key leaders, secondly, have a key message. They supply a key message. It is the gospel. Now, I want you to listen to a wonderful variety of ways that the gospel was preached, explained, described, applied throughout the book of Acts. We're just gonna kind of run from left to right here. Look at Acts chapter two, verse 38. Peter said to them at the end of his sermon, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ right here for the forgiveness of sins. That's the gospel, that's what you need is forgiveness of sins. You and I have sinned against God. We have offended him greatly. He is holy and our only hope is in the gospel which supplies for us forgiveness the wiping away of our transgressions. Look at chapter three, verse 26. Peter says at another time, for you first, God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. That's what we need in the gospel is that kind of a call. We have wicked ways in which we live. We need to be turned from them We need the blessing of the Son on us to turn us, and the only way we can do that is if he is raised from the dead and vindicated. That's the gospel. Chapter four, verse 12, you know this, there is is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. I like how the verse begins and ends. There is salvation, we must be saved. And the only way that's gonna happen is in one man. There is no one else. There's not a line. There's not a multiple choice option. There's just one. There's no one else to look to. There is no other name under heaven that has been given by which we must be saved. In Acts chapter 8, as the gospel expanded into Samaria, there is a man named Simon who was a magician, and he looked like he repented, and he was baptized, and he was a part of them, and then he went off the rails, and this is what Peter said to him. In Acts chapter 8, verse 22, therefore repent of this wickedness of yours and pray earnestly to the Lord that if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. Our hearts have intentions that malign and, uh, God and, and uh, stain our, our own souls and we must be forgiven at the heart level and we are called to repent and turn to the gospel. In Acts chapter 10, as Peter takes the gospel to a Gentile in his household. Acts chapter 10, verse 43, look at it here. Acts 10, 43, Peter says to Cornelius and all who are gathered in his home, of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. It's not that most people who believe in his name receive forgiveness of sins. No, every single one who does receives forgiveness of sins. What hope to offer in the gospel. On Paul's first missionary journey in Acts chapter 13, verse 38, he's in Pisidian Antioch. Acts 13, 38 and 39. This is what he says to the Jews in the synagogue. He says, let it be known to you, brothers, that through him forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you and that in him everyone who believes is justified. How many are justified? How many are declared righteous who believe? Everyone who believes is justified from all things which you could not be justified through the law of Moses. Through him, forgiveness of sins is offered in the gospel. Later on in that same missionary journey in Acts chapter 14, verse 15 in Lystra, Paul heals a man and the people come to offer sacrifices to Paul and to Barnabas. Look at verse 15. He says, men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of the same nature as you, proclaiming the gospel to you that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. This is what we do. We worship our desires. We worship our lusts. And these people just put an image to it, to their lust, to their desire. And they worship these empty things And the gospel proclaimed calls us to turn from those vain things to a God who is alive and offers to us life. After that first missionary journey, there is an important Jerusalem council that takes place, Acts chapter 15, verse 11. They need to clarify what the gospel is. Can the gospel also have with it good works to be done in the law? 
Peter says, he protects the gospel, he says, but we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they, the Gentiles, also are. We are saved not by merit, we are saved only by unmerited favor, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's the good news of the gospel. On Paul's second missionary journey, Acts chapter 17, verse three, he is in Thessalonica, and he is in the synagogue, and it says that he was explaining and setting before them that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying, this Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is that Christ. He's preaching the suffering and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Later in that same chapter, as he makes his way to Athens, he is with the men with really large brains in the Areopagus, the philosophers, and he, he's with them, and he says in Acts chapter 17, verse 30, therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now commanding that everyone, everywhere should repent. So there is no exception to the gospel. There's no person, you are not the exception to the gospel. There's nobody who's the exception to the gospel. That somehow most people need the gospel, but you just need a different message. No, we all need the same message. Everyone found everywhere needs the gospel to be preached to them, to repent. Why? Verse 31, because God has fixed a day. It's marked on his calendar. He has a day on his calendar. It's marked, it's fixed, it's not moving. We are a day closer to it today than we were yesterday. It's a day in which he will judge the world, and when he judges the world, it will be right, it will be just, it will be judged in righteousness. Having furnished proof, or he'll do it through a man whom he picked, whom he determined. How do we know the man? Having furnished proof to all by raising him from the dead, that's none other than Jesus. Paul continues on his third missionary journey, Acts chapter 20, verse 21. He is at the end of his third missionary journey. He has gathered the elders of Ephesus together, and he says to them in Acts chapter 20, verse 21, I've been solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks about repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. It's the call of the gospel to repent toward God, to turn 180 degrees toward him, and then to cast everything you know of yourself on him to be saved. Acts 26, Paul has been in prison in Caesarea for two years, and he gets to testify before King Agrippa in Acts chapter 26, verse 18, and as he gives his testimony of what happened to him on the road to Damascus, Jesus said to Paul, Um, I'm sending you to the Gentiles, verse 18, to open their eyes. See, that's what the gospel does. It has the power to take eyes that have scales over them and are cemented shut and the eyes can be opened so that they may turn from darkness to light. For the first time, you may be able to see that you're actually in darkness before God and you need out, you need hope, you need light. You can turn from the authority of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. A few verses later in verse 23, Paul said, this is what prophets and Moses said was going to take place, that the Christ was to suffer and that as the first of the resurrection from the dead, he was going to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. That is what you and I need. We need to come out of our sinful darkness. We need to be offered light. The gospel alone offers that light. And here is what is so great about this progression of the message of the gospel throughout Acts. Did you notice it did not change? Did you notice that? It fit into every different context possible. If it was a Jewish context in Jerusalem, that was the message. When it went to the Samaritans who are vastly different than the Jews, it was the same message. When it went to Greek idolaters in Lystra who wanted to sacrifice to men, there was one message, it was the gospel. When it went to Ephesus to people who were steeped in the the occult, there was only one message. When Paul was at the philosophical center of the world in Athens, there was one message, 
the gospel. Before common people, you give them the gospel. If you are before governors and kings gathered in their pomp and circumstance, you give them the gospel. There's only one message for all of those settings, the gospel of Jesus Christ crucified for forgiveness of sins. Repent and believe in him. So what confidence can you have as you take that one and only message to your children, to your parents, to each other in church, to your coworkers, to your classmates. It doesn't matter what the context is. It can even be tribal men in the mountains of Papua New Guinea, and there's one message. There is salvation in no one else, but there is no other name that has been given among men by which we must be saved. So listen, there is no setting you will ever come across that will require you to alter the message. There is no setting you'll be in, there'll be no conversation you'll be in that will require you to abandon that message to think of another one. So the key leaders entrusted that key message of the gospel, thirdly then, to key servants. Key servants, who are the key servants? Well, back in Acts chapter one, they are designated as witnesses. Let me remind you of Acts chapter one, verse eight. We're just gonna go from left to right through Acts about 17 times. The next four hours are gonna seem like 50 minutes. It's gonna be really great. (laughs) You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and with that power from the Spirit, you shall be something. This is your identity. You are witnesses, he says to his disciples. Witnesses. The key servants are witnesses. Witnesses of what? They're witnesses primarily of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. God the Son did not stay on earth and just proclaim the message himself. He could have, it would have been really effective. And he did not entrust the gospel to an angel flying in mid heaven. He'll do that one day also. But the apostles were the key servants. So the key leaders entrusted their one and only key message to the key servants. And they knew they were witnesses, eyewitnesses. In fact, look at what they do when they have to replace Judas. Acts chapter one, verse 21. They say, therefore it was necessary that of the men who have accompanied us, all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up from us, one of these must become what? A witness with us of his resurrection. So they're convinced we need one more eyewitness. And the way that we're going to find him is it has to be somebody who's been with us from when Jesus was baptized all the way from when Jesus ascended. We got to have one of those kinds of guys. There's 120 of them, verse 15, in the room. How many of the 150 matched that criteria? Two were left. And they put forward, verse 23, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice and Matthias. And God made it clear it was Matthias. And all who believed become witnesses. As they go into Samaria and are chased out by persecution from Jerusalem, they are all witnesses. And you and I are witnesses of what we know the word of God testifies to in regards to Jesus raised from the dead. So the key leaders, number one, entrusted the key message to the gospel, uh, of the gospel to the key servants. Well, what were they supposed to do with that gospel? Were they supposed to act it out? Were they supposed to do to demonstrate the gospel. Acts makes it very clear that it's neither of those. The key servants carried out the key activity, number four, which was preaching, proclaiming, heralding the gospel. Verbal proclamation, heralding of the good news, Peter preached on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verse 14 and following. Peter preached again in the temple in Acts chapter 3. Let me show you this key activity just in Jerusalem and then one key activity in Samaria. And we won't even touch Paul because that would take us from chapter 13 to 28. But let me show you just some. Go to Acts chapter 4, verse 1. This is in Jerusalem. Acts chapter 4, verse 1. 
as they were speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them. They weren't very happy about it. Verse two, being greatly agitated because they were teaching the people. And here it is. They were proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. Verse four, but many of those who had heard the message, they heard the message. You see, faith, uh, salvation comes by faith, right? Through hearing the gospel, they believed and the m- number of men came to be about 5,000. Don't doubt the method. Don't doubt the activity, which is the proclamation of the gospel. Don't abandon it for something else that you think works better. There is nothing else that works better. Drop down to verse 17. They get in trouble with the religious authority in, Jer- in Jerusalem, and the religious authority says in verse 17, lest it spread any further among the people, let us warn them to stop the activity, to speak no longer to any man in this name. And when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or to teach at all in the name of Jesus. So look, even the enemies know what the activity is. We've got to knock off this verbal proclamation and teaching of the word of God. Look at verse 20. What did Peter and John say? We cannot stop speaking about what we have seen. We're witnesses and what we have heard. Drop down to verse 29. They go back. They gather with their friends. They pray. And this is what they pray. Verse 29, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your slaves may what? Speak your word with all confidence. Drop down to verse 29. And when they had prayed earnestly, the place where they had gathered together was shaken. They were filled, all of them, with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak the word of God with all confidence. In chapter 5, verse 19. Peter is in jail. They laid hand on the apostles, John with him. Verse 19, but during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the prison and taking them out, he said what? Go and do what? Stand and speak to the people in the temple the whole message of this life. Upon hearing this, they entered into the temple about daybreak and they began to teach. That's exactly what they did. Drop down to verse 28. They get brought back. They get in trouble, they get brought back to the religious leadership and they say, we strictly commanded you not to continue teaching in this name and yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. What a strange turn of words that they have no idea what they're saying. But Peter and the apostles answered and said, we must obey God rather than men. Drop down to verse 40. Gamaliel says, you know what? Uh, Don't, Let these men alone. If it's of men, it's going to die. If it's of God, you're going to be even fighting against God. So they followed his advice. And after calling the apostles in and beating them, they commanded them one more time not to speak in the name of Jesus and then released them. So they went on their way from the presence of the Sanhedrin, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease the activity They did not cease teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. Stephen, in Acts chapter 6, gets into it, gets into a tangle with the religious leadership. But some men from the synagogue, of what was called the synagogue of the freedmen, including both Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and some from Cilicia and Asia, they rose up and they were arguing with Stephen but they were unable to oppose the wisdom and the spirit by whom he was, what? Speaking. There's only one activity to engage in. As the gospel expanded into Samaria, go to chapter eight. Look at verse four. Those who had been scattered went about doing what? Proclaiming the good news of the word. Now Philip went down to the city of Samaria and he began preaching Christ to them. Verse 12, and when they had believed Philip proclaiming the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, both men and women. Later in verse 35, Philip is with the Ethiopian eunuch asking for help understanding an Old Testament text, and Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he proclaimed, look, was there a crowd there? 
He's sitting in a chariot with one guy and he's proclaiming. So when you're sitting with your kids, proclaim. <laughs> uh, preach to them. It's a good thing. Verse 39, he gets snatched away by the Spirit. The eunuch no longer saw him, went on his way rejoicing. Verse 40, Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he kept proclaiming the gospel to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. So everywhere across the gospel, again, we could go to Paul in Acts chapter 13 and start there. What's the point? Just like we have only one message, we have only one activity to engage in according to the book of Acts. And that is spirit-empowered proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen, it's that simple and it's that powerful and it's that perfect. There's nothing you or I can do to improve upon that. We need to preach God's word. We need to teach God's word. We need to speak God's word. We need to use it to answer questions that are raised to us. It doesn't matter how the culture shifts around you from when you were a young man in the 70s to, no names, until you're older now and in the 20s. The message is the same, the activity you engage in is the same, you just herald the gospel, you proclaim it, you teach it, you speak it, you answer difficult questions with it. So, the key leaders, number one, who are the Godhead, they entrusted the key message of the gospel to the key servants who carried out, fourthly, that key activity with that gospel, which is the proclamation of it. And from that comes, lastly, the key expression. What comes out of all of that? What results in all of that? It's the church. The church comes out of that. The key expression in every city from Jerusalem to Samaria to Antioch of Syria, where Paul and Barnabas and Silas were sent out of, to the island of Cyprus, throughout all of the Galatian region, all the way up to Philippi, then to Thessalonica, and to Berea, and then to Athens, and then to Corinth. And then on Paul's third missionary journey, it goes to Ephesus and all of Asia. And then by the end of Acts, it's Rome. And then even after Acts, it goes to Spain, and then the island of Crete, and beyond. Everywhere, the Spirit-empowered preaching of the gospel by eyewitness servants resulted in one thing and one thing only. The church, the local church. This is why I say I think that the book of Acts could be called the New Testament manual for church planting because that's exactly what happened. So those are your five keys. The key leaders of the Godhead entrusted the key message of the gospel to the key servants who carried out the key activity with that gospel. They proclaimed it and from that came the key expression called the church. And all of those keys then prepare us then for our last main idea here, and that is the theme of Acts. The theme of Acts. When we went through Acts from about October of 2011 to August of 2015, almost four years, this theme in Acts, I think, shaped my life and Grace Bible Church more than any other. What is the theme? It is the triumph of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Acts 1.8 lays out that track on which the triumphant gospel expanded across the Roman Empire in the first century from the capital city of the Jews in Jerusalem all the way to the capital city of the Roman Empire in Rome. The gospel was triumphant all within a period of about 30 years. The Mediterranean world saw that triumph of the gospel of Jesus Christ everywhere it looked. If you were with us from October 2011 to August 2015, you probably heard the theme expressed this way, you can't stop the gospel. Or God has no plan Bs. There's only plan A, there's only message A, there's only activity A, there's no message B, there's no activity B, there's no plan B. So in connection with that theme, I wanna remind you with the time left, just as some important truths that I would hope would bring and build your confidence in the power of the gospel and just remind you of things that you already know that you can excel still more in them. And I'll, and I'll, I'll just state it this way. What can't stop the gospel? Here's the first thing. It's your weakness. Your weakness cannot stop the gospel. Not in your home, not at your school, 
Not at your workplace. Not anywhere. Back in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, everything that God the Father transacted with God the Son in regards to God the Spirit was all about power. Not your power. Not you getting stronger, but God just supplying His power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. God's whole plan of his gospel expansion, his church expansion across the world to the end of the earth is not about you. It's not about your power. It's not about what you bring to the table. It is all about what the Holy Spirit brought from heaven, his power. Let me just show you just a few of these examples. Look at chapter four, verse seven. The religious leaders are all upset with Peter. We just saw part of this. And when the religious leaders placed them, the disciples, in their midst, they began to inquire. So watch, even the enemies know. What do they ask? Verse 7, what do they ask? What power is this? They know. They see it. They know. Or in what name have you done this? And then Peter, not to be surprised, filled with the Holy Spirit, said, and he gave them his whole speech. Drop down to verse 12. There's no there's salvation in no one else. There's no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. That's a pretty bold thing to say in front of the people of power over you. Verse 13, and they saw it. As they observed the confidence of Peter and John, they comprehended, wait a minute, this isn't like the kind of power we use. This isn't the power of rhetoric. They comprehended that they were uneducated and just ordinary people. We observe a confidence, we observe a power, we observe something that doesn't fit into any one of our categories of power. That's because it doesn't. Drop down to verse 29. They pray, Lord, take note of their threats. Grant that your slaves may speak your word with all confidence. Verse 31, and when they prayed earnestly, the place where they had gathered together was shaken. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak the word of God with confidence. There's power. Chapter five, verse 32, more of the same. We are witnesses of these things and so is the Holy Spirit whom God gave to those who obey. They just stay right in the face of the religious leadership. Verse 38, watch what Gamaliel says. This is great. He could see it. So in the present case, I also say to you, so this is one of the religious elite saying to the rest, stay away from these men. Just leave them alone. If this plan or action is of men, meaning it has only man's power, it will be what? Overthrown. Piece of cake. It's over. That's what happens to everything man does. But, verse 39, if it is of God, what? you will not be able to overthrow them. In fact, you might even find yourself fighting against God. So the wicked knew what this was when they saw it. Oh, there's so many verses to look at. Go to chapter 10, verse 38. Peter's preaching to Cornelius. Even Jesus did not operate without the Spirit's power. You know Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. So they didn't do anything differently than what Jesus did. Chapter 11, verse 16. I remembered the word of the Lord, how he used to say, John baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. There's gonna be a plunging that takes place in connection with the Spirit that will bring every possible difference. Verse 22, the gospel expands up to Antioch of Syria. News about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, so they send Barnabas off to Antioch, who then, when he arrived, saw the grace of God, rejoiced, and began to encourage them with all, all with a purposeful heart to remain true to the Lord. For he was a good man, Barnabas was. He was full of the Holy Spirit. He had power in what he did. And a considerable crowd was brought to the Lord. Listen, 
Nobody gets brought to the Lord any other way than by the Spirit's power through the preaching of the Word. Chapter 13, Paul's first missionary journey. They were in the church at Antioch of Syria, ministering to the Lord, fasting. The Holy Spirit speaks. One with power says, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul. I have work for them to do. Verse 4, they sent them out by the Spirit. Go to chapter 14, verse 3. They're in Iconium. And there they spent a long time speaking boldly with reliance upon the Lord. That's another way of saying they had power. They did not depend on themselves. They would not turn to their own abilities. They relied on the Lord. Granting signs and wonders be done through their hands. Look at verse 26 and 27. When they finish their missionary journey, the first one they come back, and what's on their mind after they've been gone for their first missionary journey? Here's what it is. Look, they sailed to Antioch from where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had, that they had fulfilled. And when they had arrived and gathered the church together, they began to report all the things that what? God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. You see, it is about, it's not about your weakness. It's not about what you bring to the table. It is about what God provides through his son and by his spirit in bringing the gospel to the ends of the earth. Let me show you another one. Go to chapter 20. Paul with the Ephesian elders, he says this. He said, you yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews. Now, how would that make you feel? Would you feel pretty strong? Tears, humility, trials. But look at verse 20. You know how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable. It didn't matter venue publicly, house to house. Paul would not shrink back because he wasn't relying on his own power. When he did rely on his own power, he did shrink back. In fact, where is that one? I'll tell you that one later. You can come find me. Go to Acts 23, verse 10. A great dissension was developing because the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces. Paul has been arrested in Jerusalem. He ordered the troops to go down, take him away from them by force, and bring him back to the barracks. But on that very night, the Lord stood at his side. Where's the Lord? With him, at his side. And he said, take courage. For as you have solemnly borne witness to my cause at Jerusalem, you must do the same thing in Rome. So the Lord draws near gives courage to Paul. I know where it is, it's back in chapter 18. I want you to see this one. Paul is in Corinth and he was pretty disheartened in Corinth. Look at chapter 18, verse nine. He had to leave quickly from Thessalonica and Berea and he's concerned about what's going on there. He gets persecuted in Corinth and the Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, do not be afraid. Guess what Paul was? He was afraid. And he said, do not be afraid. But go on speaking. Guess what Paul was tempted to not do? Speak. Guess what he was tempted to do? He was tempted to be silent. Don't do any of that. Don't be afraid. Go on speaking. Don't be silent. Why? Because I'm with you. Even to the end of the age. And no man will lay a hand on you in order to harm you, for I have many people in the city. Who's at work? It is primarily Jesus and Jesus alone. So what can't stop the gospel? Your weakness can't. You're going to shrink back in fear in your home. You're going to shrink back in fear at class. You're going to shrink back in fear. You're going to lack courage over and over and over. And that's what you do. That's what you bring to the table. And all you have to do is remember the truths of this, 
that it is about God. It is about his spirit. It is about his son being present with you through the preaching of the gospel. This is why you keep your life aligned with the preaching of the gospel, with the advancement of the gospel across the world. This is what you do, in your, starting in your own neighborhood, in your own home, because then you have power. Let me just give you some others. Uh, we won't take time to go through them because we're out of time. What can't stop the gospel? Persecution cannot stop the gospel. In fact, persecution only makes witnesses more talkative. The more that they were persecuted, the more they spoke. And persecution never hindered anybody coming to Christ. It's not like if, if, if when people mock you, if you think I'm being mocked for the gospel right now and that's gonna make other people not wanna believe because they're gonna see I'm being made a fool of. That's not the way it works at all. I'm just gonna give you one verse. Acts 4, 1 to 4, they're preaching they were greatly agitated. They were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus' resurrection from the dead. They laid hands on him, put him in jail until the next day. It was already evening. But many of those who had heard the message believed. So they were persecuted and they believed anyway. They believed anyway. And the number of men came to be about 5,000. That's just the men. You have nothing to fear with persecution. It can't stop the gospel. Limited education, Acts chapter four, verse 13, and profound ordinariness don't stop the gospel. Rulers and governing officials cannot stop the gospel. It doesn't matter if they're religious authorities, it doesn't matter if they're pagan authorities. There's a whole chapter devoted in the middle of Acts, Acts chapter 12, as the gospel has already gone through Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and before it goes into the end of the earth with Paul, there's Acts chapter 12, and the whole chapter is about King Herod who gets eaten by worms because he kills John and he's gonna do the same thing to Peter. And that whole chapter is devoted, it's there for a reason, to say, hey kings, you better be careful what you do. Rulers and governing officials cannot stop the gospel. And then there's a whole nother chapter just devoted to natural elements, a whole terrible storm on the Mediterranean. And Paul on a ship with Luke. How they survived this, I have no idea, but it didn't stop the gospel. And that's really important for us when we have missionaries whose homes get destroyed by 7.6 earthquakes. It's very discouraging. But it doesn't have to be. because nothing can stop the gospel. The Holy Spirit empowered servants of the gospel when they remain resolutely determined to keep pressing forward, nothing stops the gospel. So here is the book of Acts in its unfolding theme. From Jerusalem through Judea and Samaria to the end of the earth, nothing can stop the gospel. And that's how the Holy Spirit intends this book to impact you and me today. So what's the takeaway for churches that um, are increasingly persecuted or even declared illegal by governments? What's the takeaway for students who feel increasingly intimidated by their teachers, their profs? What's the takeaway for moms and dads as you fear the coming days of what it will be like for your little ones to grow up? It doesn't matter what the presenting fear is. And it doesn't matter what the presenting threat is. It doesn't matter what the presenting obstacle is, what the presenting disadvantage is, because none of them can stop what God is doing. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. The Father transacted with the Son to give the Spirit, and the power is there for God's gospel to accomplish everything it needs to accomplish through the church to the end of the earth. Do you believe that? But the most important question for the hour tonight is, has the gospel triumphed in your own heart? Has the gospel triumphed in your own personal life over your sin? The gospel is your only hope for forgiveness. And the gospel is your only hope for God's just wrath against you to be turned away and the gospel is your only hope for a new life to live with him. 
but you must turn away from all that you've made of yourself and all of the idols of your heart that you've chased after. You must turn away from those vain things to turn to a living God who is at the right hand of the Father and he gives life. He forgives sin. He has power for you to live in. Believe him, believe his good news for you and you will be saved. He does not turn you away. Let's pray. Father in heaven, this is truly good news for sinners like us. Thank you for being so powerful, for being committed unwaveringly to the advancement of your gospel and the advancement of your church, the advancement of your gospel, even in our own lives as we continue to be sanctified by it. Thank you. Thank you for investing in us a power that is your very presence by your spirit. Thank you for being near to us, promising that you will be with us to the end of the age. We are so weak, we are so frail. We stumble in so many ways. And yet, none of what you have charged us to do to the ends of the earth relies on any of our weakness or our power. In fact, it bypasses it. You're not interested in what we bring to the table in our own lack of strength. You are only interested in your spirit's power working in us. Lord, I pray for us that we would be spirit-empowered people for the sake of the gospel in our homes, our schools, our workplaces, in this church, beyond this church, to Gilbert, to New Orleans, to Papua New Guinea, to Italy, every place that you may lead us, Father. We wanna do this for the sake of your son's name, the only name by which a man may, must be saved. May his name be magnified through us. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.